Section five of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five Pax Germanica Servants, Fairy Tales and Tailors. Yes, comparing the domestic life of nations, I have come to think that there is a certain dead level of happiness, or at least contentment, obtaining in the German Empire. It is enjoyed soberly enough, it is true, but enjoyed in the same degree by no other nation. Dead level seems the exact word to express what I mean. The organized happiness of a sensible, patient, non-nervous people. It is a happiness which is legislated for, happiness that is adjudicated in equal portions to every Teuton in exchange for what is so much dearer to Latins than any amount of ease or comfort, their libre arbitre. The Kaiser is pleased to dispense happiness nay according to some of his recent utterances he considers himself bound before god to do so so he spends his days dispensing legislative ordinances which beseem the genius fit him with the idiosyncrasies of a people so biddable and reasonable as his subjects he simply and formally guarantees to them a fixed sum of well-being and I think he does this work very well. No misery shows in Germany. There is no large-eyed, apathetic, wizened, deplorable slum child to be seen hanging about in the squalid alleys of H, near the tenements that house them, just as they do in York or Birmingham. There are no dreary collections of sodden rags slouching along the gutters, picking up refuse shrieking bad language if interrupted that answer to the name of woman such as one sees rarely and more rarely now in london but still one sees them now and then and the sort of outdoor hotel dieu that stretches all along the thames embankment at midnight the free seats which a kind policeman is apt to warn the better class against sitting on are things a german would blench to look upon and refuse to believe in when told but on the other hand no one ever looks very happy in germany i never saw a face that could be called at all symptomatic of the joie de vivre no one ever seems to be able to afford to go on the bust or to care to do so in england bust generally means beer and too much of it in Germany, the stream of good liquor, for the light paying almost for the asking, flows so evenly, so unadulteratedly, that the delicious forbidden fruit feeling that tempts a man to exceed is absent. Beer in Germany is properly made and properly kept. It is excellent, it is delicious sometimes, but it is no treat. It is just common. In countries where wine takes the place of beer, there is no such thing as forbidden grapes. Thus on all hands is the lure of the unpermitted abolished in Germany. Taxed, admonished, cared for, managed out of all individuality, this great people seem to lie in the hollow of the iron hand with a collective contentment, realising all through the course of their lives Wordsworth's senile ideal, quote, to live without ambition, hope, or aim, unquote. and growing so fat upon the regime as to reassure outsiders that there is no a yen bite of in wit, no pulling against the collar. There is no official cruelty. Perhaps individually, Germans dimly realize that they are fulfilling the ideal summed up by Rosencrantz and Gilderstern for the benefit of Hamlet too greedy of happiness Quote, happy in that they are not over happy nor do they seem to be where these cynical gentlemen were not either the very button of fortune's cap to stand for a few minutes in a german waiting-room and survey the mandates on the walls is to realize how this patient people is in government leading strings 
why the entire landscape is plastered over with quadrilateral boards bearing the words verboten verbotener weg verbotener eingang verbotener ausgang rauchen verboten nach acht uhr morgens die stucke ausschütteln verboten forbidden road forbidden entrance forbidden exit smoking forbidden forbidden to shake tablecloths out of the windows after eight o'clock in the morning all these forbiddings meet you at every turn in germany they are alternately grotesque reasonable irritating and sufficient cause for revolutions the game of poker is forbidden in every state in germany except in the grand duchy of oldenburg it is to all intents and purposes forbidden to introduce a young male acquaintance to a young female acquaintance because supposing an illicit amour should occur after your introduction you will be held to have played the part of pandarus and will be sent to prison for many months it is forbidden for socialists to be dancing masters or teachers of athletics it is forbidden for post office officials to give back the money for one damaged ten finished stamp but they may do it for ten i once witnessed the pleasant scene of a father taking three penny postage stamps to a post office over which his little boy had spilt a bottle of ink and requesting threepence in return the post office official cited the regulation to which i have just referred the father then purchased seven more postage stamps gravely tore them into fragments and received in return for the whole one mark on the other hand if you desired to travel to dorf enterful in the centre of pomerania or to northwest chester a village in pennsylvania u s a and if you will go respectfully to the railway station it will be the duty of an official in blue uniform to give you written out the times of starting of every train on any alternative route and of every steamship from the one place to the other moreover he will telegraph for you to every junction that lies between the place of your starting and the boundaries of the german empire and at each junction a railway porter will meet you and present you with your ticket for the next stage as well as with baggage checks for your luggage then there is their comprehensive system of insurance absurd but far more sensible than the english form in that it really is insurance while the other is but a form of compulsory saving would english servants choose to give their services under the humiliating conditions which affect their german counterparts the german manservant is hardened to the dossier the card which is out against him and that can be referred to by the police at his every change of place and severely modify the conditions of it he is humiliated at every turn and takes it out in tips so far as i can make out for it is a fact that he is entitled to scrutinize the visiting list of any house into which he is about to enter and for what purpose that he and the tax assessor may assess adequately the approximate value of the tips that he will receive for every guest every caller is expected to tip the man or woman who lets him in or takes off his coat and every time he calls an ample visiting list composed of rich people the tax assessor takes this fact into consideration when assessing the amount of a man or woman's tax i was walking through the streets of a small german town with one of these revenue officials who was a connection of joseph leopold's when he observed the servant male of one of his friends said he to me that girl has got a new feather in her hat i shall have to inquire if her wages have not been raised this of course was a joke but it came painfully near the knuckle such petty tyrannies abound still there are compensations mighty compensations i had it driven into me very plainly one rainy saturday afternoon when we had taken a tram ride from the town of trier to a village called eupen 
At that time I had a house in London, and in this house I had left two female servants, Norfolk girls. I say girls, for with amiable tolerance one always somehow calls servants girls. They like it. But these were women who had been with me for eighteen years. They lived downstairs in a semi-basement, light enough, comfortable enough. They had no distressing dossier. They had no threepenny tax to pay once a week, as yet. They had no need beyond curiosity to scrutinise my visiting list. They had what they loved, tradesmen to call for orders. They were utterly self-contained. I mean that they had no occasion to go beyond the front gate. They did not, even under the pleasant regime of the telephone, need to be in continual readiness to be sent out in white caps and aprons, as was our cruel fashion in the eighties, for cabs or to send telegrams. Yet this system, wrong-headedly, they much preferred. Many a picture had I drawn for them of the pleasant continental fashion of marketing, the life of the city square, the on of the village pump, the occasional street row, the fallen horse, the derelict, unwieldy lads being held to the lock-up, the interests of the pavement generally. All this excitement, I said, is their continental sister's daily pabulum. But recognised statutory outlet these virgins of the rocks cling to, and goodness knows how thin a strand of pleasure it is, their Sunday out, their ineluctable, indestructible privilege. But it is all they have, and what the eye sees not, the heart does not lack. If my own austere and middle-aged maids had been with me at Open on that Saturday afternoon, they would have turned away with loathing from the cheerful sights I saw. They are too old now, and they have not been brought up to it. They are quite content with their own particular Valpurgus night of once a fortnight. A number of healthy, nicely dressed girls got out of the tram at Open. Some were alone, some were accompanied by young men, sheepish, but not nearly so sheepish as the English youth of the same rank. Some, indeed, were quite sprightly and wore a leaf in the ribbon of their soft felt hats. All the girls were gay and with good figures, though inclined to be stout. How many young servant girls in England have decent figures, hold themselves up and have rosy cheeks? Indeed, the exigencies of her place in England demand that an adequate parlour-maid should be slim and interesting-looking. Tisic, if possible. We had a girl once with a delicate complexion like a rose-leaf that she chewed rice and starch to keep up. She died later. Not much later. These young people fared towards a restaurant whose porch was wreathed with vines. Inside there was a bar and a big table spread with different sorts of sandwiches. Attendants hung about ready to dispense them. There were little tables with variegated cloths on them and flowers in vases. There was a string band of a dozen performers on a raised estrade and a large open space in front of the band fringed by the little tables. I had a British longing for tea, or at any rate for coffee. I said to Joseph Leopold, can't we go in there and have something? Joseph Leopold showed himself strongly averse from the suggested proceeding. It really isn't the place where I could take you, he said, and I exclaimed, Why, isn't it a restaurant? It is the place where the servants of Trier spend their Sundays out, he said. We should embarrass them very much if we went in and sat amongst them. They will drink and dance and drink and dance with their sweethearts till it is time to go home. When will that be? About ten o'clock. What time do you expect your cook to be in on her day out? But if we lived in Trier and had a house and had servants, should I allow them to come to a place like this? You couldn't stop them. It is the proper thing all over the country. 
you probably won't know these well-dressed young ladies again tomorrow when you go to call on Herr Professor and B and one of them opens the door to you. Think how embarrassed she and you would be if you sat and drank beer in her company today and watched her dancing with the man of Professor G. Our servants, I said, wouldn't let themselves down so as to come to a place like this. Have our servants got apple cheeks under the flower-wreathed hats and bouncing, springing figures under drab mackintoshes? I consider the English system of grey slaves immured in basements disgraceful. And when you do let them out, they have nothing more lively to do than visit other grey slaves in basements or walk the pair of them gloomy, hopeless about grey streets and stare at the closed doors of theatres and restaurants. Here happiness is catered for. Pane et sensibus. Well, come away into the forest, and we may find a forester's lodge where they'll give us some beer, and perhaps a slice of black bread and some butter. We walked along for miles, like Hansel and Gretel, or Eurinda and Euringel, never saw a forester's hut or any cottage at all. A German forest is a forest. It is not only a desert place where the fear the wild beast congregate. I fancy it was my grim-fed upbringing which made me stare with all my eyes when I was first introduced to an English forest, the new forest, the heathery open waste that occupies nearly the whole of Hampshire, this is beautiful, I said, but it is not a forest. It is no more a forest than my native Northumberland, with the wide wind-swept moors affording cover to neither man nor beast. Here in William the Conqueror's great piece of devastation, no tailor could lose himself or climb into a high tree to, quote, spy the glimmer of the lamp in a woodman's cottage where he may spend the night, unquote. Sentences like these were in my mind. It was as still as a church. Not a breath of wind was stirring. Not even a sunbeam shone through the thick leaves. These legends of Grimm, read by the nursery firesides for the mere story and sensation, the charm to be realised afterwards in cold middle age, nearly all begin like this. Or, if it is not a tailor, it is a king's son who has, quote, a mind to see the world. Setting forth alone, or with only a very faithful friend, he either loses his way, or he comes to some charmed cottage inhabited by an old woman who is a witch. But it is a real forest that is meant, nothing in the least like the new forest, the nearest thing to that in Germany is the Lüneburger Heide, and that is not the locale of these tales of perilous charm. Mr. Walter de la Mer, I think, to judge from his poetry, must have walked in German forests through long days and felt the exciting sense of wayfaring and the soothing, numbing impact of the slow procession of the hours. The leafy canopies hide the blue sky, and those hours seem to pass audibly in the ghastly silence, like the stillness of a room with a coffin in it, which is a permanent feature of these birdless wildernesses. They are full, nevertheless, of creeping, prowling, inarticulate creatures, the fall of a decaying leaf, the spring of a bent twig, the sly pad of a deer, in its rustling progress through the black brushwood in search of rare spring or distant river, bears an uncertain significance that makes the heart stand still. It is bound to feed the sense of romantic excitement to which every person brought up on legend is inclined to give way on the slightest, vaguest appeal to the basic faiths of his childhood, Though it is nearly always a forest in German legend, it is not always a prince. Sometimes it is a wonderful fiddler, or an experienced huntsman, or more frequently than either of these, it is a tailor. 
the germans have a particular fondness for tailor heroes they are little and plucky like pepin deristal who must really have been the original of the superstition that good stuff is packed in little bundles and i am sure moreover that they must have come from germany the prince is as a rule a fainéant he sits down and puts his head in his hands after he has lost his suite and does not know which way to turn a princess is generally found at once to look after him but the experienced huntsmen and the wonderful fiddlers and the lusty tailors are of a finer invention they climb into the trees to get their bearings they pass the night on one of the branches to avoid falling prey to wild beasts and in the morning they generally see daylight and a way out or plunge still deeper to find the charmed cottage and the old woman in it who is a witch i must quote some verses of a poem of walter de la Mer's, which to me exquisitely renders the sense of imminence the almost fear of the magic loneliness induced in the romantic mind by prolonged periods spent in a german forest weary pleasingly exhausted one is ready for such faint otherworld suggestions as mr de la Mer is able to give us by a touch a word a cadence the journey heart sick of his journey was the wanderer foot sore and sad was he and a witch who long had lurked by the wayside looked out of sorcery lift up your eyes you lonely wanderer she peeped from her casement small here's shelter and quiet to give you rest young man and apples for thirst withal and he looked up out of his sad reverie and saw all the woods in green with birds that flitted feathered in the dappling the jewel bright leaves between and he lifted up his face towards her lattice and there alluring wise slanting through the silence of the long past dwelt the still green witch's eyes and there fell upon his sense the briar haunting the air with its breath and the faint shrill sweetness of the birds throats their tents of leaves beneath and there was the witch in no wise heeding her arbour and fruit-filled dish her pitcher of well water and clear damask all that the weary wish and the last gold beam across the green world faltered and failed as he remembered his solitude and the dark night's inhospitality on that particular afternoon when joseph leopold and i walked to find a cottage for tea the sun was not quote, shining bright no gentle breeze was blowing among the trees and everything did not seem gay and pleasant that is one favourite beginning of grimm's no this was such a god-forsaken afternoon as that described in Jorinda and Joringel. For as these two doomed young lovers went out to wander in the forest, all was beautiful and bewitched. Quote, the sun was shining through the stems of the trees and brightening up the dark leaves and the turtle doves cooing softly between the may bushes. Unquote. Then, feeling the deadly influence of witchcraft, Jorinda begins to cry and sits down in the sunshine with Uringel, who cries too. Quote, they had wandered too far and come too near the enchanted castle, whose walls they saw through the brushwood close to them. Unquote. Yes, all unwittingly, they have come into the circle of the charm. And the old witch who lives in the castle, and who must have a grudge against Jorinda and been in love with Uringel, changes the maiden into a nightingale she begins to jug 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 into the ears of her agonized sweetheart as he sits spellbound with horror beside her he rises to his feet and stands like a stone and cannot stir or weep while the witch in the form of an owl mocks them and when the sun sets at last she comes out of her bush in her human shape and carries off the nightingale still jug jugging 
the glamour of that tale was on me as i walked through the woods at the side of joseph leopold and watched the sun going down strange red toadstools began to glow under the dead leaves in between the twisted tree roots we were on the fringe of a much deeper darker patch of forest and our paths seemed to sway and grow more meagre and finally to lead straight into it it was about five o'clock we were three miles from trev and we must follow that path to get home i caught hold of his arm and wondered what terrible sound would soon break the stillness just as we turned into the wildwood and lost even the consoling sight of the red disk of the sun setting between the fir trees below and glowing like a woodcutter's fire i heard a cry i had never heard before and one more terrible than i have ever imagined harsh raucous something between a laugh and a roar it left me nearly as spellbound as Uringel when he missed his love from his side. What's that? Oh, what's that? I breathed. A wild cat, Joseph Leopold said composedly. End of section five. Section 6 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6a Beer Gardens versus Bear Gardens. The German social institution called Wirtschaftsgarten is usually roughly translated in England by the words beer garden. And these two words are always pronounced in England with a certain degree of tolerant moral deprecation and did you really go to one my dear the Wirtschafts garden is to my mind one of the most reasonable utilitarian and at the same time poetical arrangements of a reasonable utilitarian and poetical people in england where some emancipated souls read faust in translations the scene in Auerbach's cellar is always taken to represent this, the German people's staple form of amusement. Hence the shocked question I have quoted which greets travellers on their return from Cologne or Bremen. I should say that the parallel scene of the cellar might perhaps have been found in the 60s in London night cellars, so painedly described by Thackeray in the Newcombs. Colonel Newcomb, who had attended the same form of entertainment in the thirties, before he went to India, is said to be indescribably shocked, and takes his young son away with fracas. But the open-air decent entertainment which the modern Garten Wirtschaften represent also obtained in England in his day. I have faint recollections of the last flickering symptoms of it in my own youth. I remember in those summer days of childhood, which seemed so long and so much more summery than any summer afternoons that can occur to me now, I remember walking forth with my parents and perhaps some other parents and children in very hot weather about a mile out of Durham along the banks of the Ware, thinly flowing on its parched bed under peel or wood. And we went to a place called the Strawberry Gardens near Maiden Castle. The children were buoyed up on their long walk by talk of strawberries to be gathered off the bushes. And when we got there, we all had to sit down on rustic benches made in one with tables that you had to fit your legs into and not kick. These seats were placed in the narrow alleys of the wide, dullish, not very gay garden. We consumed well, it is so long ago, I only remember what I consumed, and that was, I think, strawberries. And these strawberries were gathered, all of them, from the beds at our feet, and they were grown in what is now as black as the black country, black but still comely, and not so black as it is today, under the drifting pall of smoke that sways hither and thither as the wind lists, and cloud wreaths that incalculably pass low overhead and stoop and 
deposit the smutty death over the land that lies prone at their mercy. Its ruin is certain now. No strawberries would grow in Maiden Castle Wood in these days, even if the railway had not swallowed up their habitat. My parents on these occasions drank tea, I think. They certainly did not drink beer. Beer would probably have been cheaper, but by that time small beer was no longer the drink of the gentry, and we ate our strawberries on leaves, not on plates. That I do remember. This was not the only place in the little cathedral town where such mild junketing as pleased English people then, and pleases Germans now, was catered for. I remember another place of the same description supplying the same felt want of simple people, situate on the other side of Durham, a wild and weedy garden among the ruins of the old leper hospital of Kepir. I believe the tea garden was run by the patrons of an old inn, the George, fragments of which still cumber the uncared-for meadow where the tea gardens were. The garden was tended then, and there were borders of flowers that children must not run across. Now, the untidiest living animal in the world, that is to say a hen, picks about in the mossy grass full of worm casts, and a donkey of the raggedest browses close up to the summer house, where my mother sat with her friends round her, and I ran up and down outside in front of them, propelling a rickety perambulator. That too is gone. The doll in the perambulator has been relegated to the lower classes. You never see a, quote, ladies child with one nowadays. The summer house, I remember, was a domed, white-painted construction of plaster with a convex roof and entrance pillars admitting you into a crescent-shaped enclosure of no particular depth. Something very like it used to stand in the avenue of trees in front of Kensington Palace, which was moved, heaven knows why, and placed near the Lancaster Gate entrance. There is yet another, forming part of the block of the palace buildings, immediately adjoining the little old door into the gardens opposite the barracks, where vagrants used to congregate, but are now chivied away by zealous park-keepers, so that pure, clean nursery-maids with their charges may shelter from the rain. They are all these erections purely Georgian, and so was the one at Kepia. I visited Kepia Hospital recently with Joseph Leopold, and went round to where the ruined tea garden lies, and stood a mature German Frau on the very place where, in my blue muslin frock with spots on it, I pushed a perambulator about in front of my early Victorian mother, sitting dignified in the summer house, wearing a blue silk dress with a lace collar, and a large hair brooch placed just under her jugular vein. Now a bed of dark green nettles grows and leans against the building that used to shelter her. Some of the bricks that formed it were showing under the plaster which had fallen down on the broken floor. Scrubby thorn bushes dotted the hummocky sward, for an old mare and an old donkey cropped the bare sustenance awarded them through cheap humanitarianism by the users of their prime. And then on another day I visited the other place that I remembered. Long, long since, les lauriers sont coupés in peel or wood on the way to Maiden Castle, where my father used to set up his easel and paint the distant cathedral towers in the hot, yellow summer haze. The ticket office of the line to Shincliffe occupies the wooded spaces where we used to sit on our dark green painted seats with twisted legs and gaze down on the little island in the middle of the ware. That too has disappeared. It was just such an island as the Lambton Worm might have coiled around. People in Durham ceased to come. They preferred a stuffy cinematograph to an innocent jaunt on a summer afternoon such as the German loves. It is perhaps the restless Celtic elements in the English population coming to the top that has unsettled it and bred this change. Or is there a more simple reason? The climate. 
and for that to be the reason i must deduce a suspicion of my own that can have i suppose no possible ground in atmospheric fact and that the meteorological data of the last fifty years will not even support was the weather in england ever less changeable i sometimes think it must have been at any rate for a long term of years and for the many years of my childhood it seemed then to be more like the weather in germany now with spring come so quickly so vividly so dashingly as to justify the enthusiasm of poets for this season their printed rhapsodies which in view of the english symptom of the spring seem fulsome in their excessive jubilation and english poetry of the period is full of nightingales may mornings violets bathed in dew we have nothing nowadays to set against all the poets expressed raptures except a speech of douglas gerald's i blame nobody but they call this spring at any rate this lost social occasion flourishes exceedingly in germany where climatic conditions coincide with the social inclinations of the mass of the people not a provincial town in germany not even a manufacturing centre like the town of gießen which in some sort corresponds with the durham of my childhood but has its belt of necessary tea gardens what would germans do without the regular family exodus of an afternoon to some place a mile or a couple of miles away from the region of their toil this is really a vital condition of middle-class existence and it is catered for most admirably foresters and lodges high up in the wooded heights of the eiffel or the teutoburger wald abandoned monasteries distant farms all have been included in this service of fresh air many a time at hildesheim or gießen or trier i have watched the mile-long stream of tea drinkers bearing laboriously but with quiet glee along the dusty tree-bordered roads to the high garden terrace of some such old convent as the schiffenberg at gießen situated on a hill of a high strong strategic position or to some valley deep settlement such as kloster arnsberg which lies low in a pleasant river meadow like Rivo in england or they take their tickets for the sahnradbahn up the eiffel at Bopard, and march miles when they get to the top till they reach the forest to sat on fleckets her where there's an aussicht and from an aussicht this enthusiastic artistic people will not be deterred even by rain i have journeyed with them and finding myself turned out of the sahnrad barn with a two-mile tramp before me in the pouring rain have murmured emphatically and aloud my wish to turn back joseph leopold obediently turning aside from the promised land of the view at my behest was forced to listen to the animate versions of the rest of the party on his pusillanimity er ist unter dem pantoffel they observed contemptuously and turning their backs to us they trudged every man jack and woman jill of them sturdily on in the rain in the other direction but indeed on golden afternoons i ask nothing better than to join on to the procession of father mother aunts and cousins and babies in arms and older children circling round their parents like dogs doubling the distance and cheering along gross magician or zante robbed all in decent black and marching with a will the men carry satchels full of home-made buns all that the restaurant will get out of them will be the price of the beer and the coffee that they cannot well bring with them the women have their knitting or fancy work in their great under pockets they are carefully and tidily dressed it was a privation to me but out of politeness i had always to keep my hat on and so had joseph leopold any member of the hapless brigade would have deeply shocked these dear decent people up to the schiffenberg near gießen it is as i have said a desperate climb there is a zigzag path up to the top of which i availed myself but i noticed those stout sable-clad german frauen 
nimbly scaling the hill where it was steepest and where there was no path at all. Up they went, the stoutest first, up the sheer bank, treading on slippery beech mast, catching on to ineffectual sticks of brushwood, prodded, hoisted and pulled by their husbands and brothers. I dare not say sweethearts, in view of the extremely familiar point d'appui, by whose means the services of the strong arm were made available. They looked like a large party of beetles, scaling the sheer sides of a precipice. Oh, but the blessed calm of the arched convent porch and stone terrace, when once one did get up there. Sitting on the terrace in the old cloisters, with tables set in the narrow way that nuns in meditation had so often paced, we called for refreshments, and looked down on the scene of our efforts. Later on we rose and went into the inn inside the walls and priced old oak chests. The walls of the staircase were whitewashed and yet they appeared to bear a leafy pattern, like a well-known Morris wallpaper. I discovered it to be a living wallpaper, composed of fir branches of even lengths disposed at regular intervals along the dado and placed in a leaning attitude, so that a fair copy of the paper Mr. Morris aptly christened Evenload was produced. All the rooms were papered in the same simple fashion, and visitors could live there at the rate of three marks a day, pension. These conventual offices were built in a circle enclosing a large platz, part grass, part gravel, with an orchard and a farmyard, a carriage yard, and a garden. Nothing, however, was railed or partitioned off. There was only one building out of use and not kept in repair, and that was the church. We went, Joseph Leopold and I, and an eccentric American poet of tenderish years into that church. Half one side aisle was open to the day, and farm implements were stored in it. Rusty plowshares, carts and lumber repugnant enough to its former inhabitants, had they been alive and cognizant of the desecration. On the more sheltered side of the building, where the roof was still good and whole, was an object which was surely an old thing when the last nun left. It was a stage on which miracle plays had been enacted. We all know that the very name, Stage, has come down to us from the fundamental necessity of the actors for a raised scaffolding. It is the primary sense of the word, the two boards and a passion of the Middle Ages. There were two floors to this erection, and on the upper one the actors, God the Father, Mary the Virgin, enacted their parts, and the heroes of the play, each with his vice at his elbow, ranted or intoned theirs. Below, roughly speaking, it was hell and there the devil and the powers of evil lived, and through a trapdoor ascended to the floor above and worked their mischief. But they always went down again abruptly, and ended in the lower regions. This machine was portable and perishable, and made of wood gaily painted. It was about the size of a modern motor omnibus. The upper floor borne up by fluted pillars, rudely carved and painted, and just such a stage, stained faintly with stained glass window colours, worm-eaten and ragged with time's defacement and the insidious damp of every day, stood on the cold stone flags of the ruined chapel of the nuns of the Schiffenberg. This remarkable object was quite rotten with age and the ravages of worms, but even in its decay it was a decorative object. The traces of original vivid painting in primary colours still clung to the decaying woodwork, and the trapdoor appeared to be intact. But the respectable way up for the heavenly choir of performers had long since disappeared, and the American poet wanted to get up on top. Very much against our judgment, he insisted on clambering up by the fluted pillars and further scraped and denuded them of the painted arabesques that decorated their poverty-shrunken bulk. Presently we saw him pottering about on top and declaiming his own verse in a sort of medieval chant, 
which would not perhaps have disgraced one of the original performers. And then with a small insidious crash he disappeared and made his descent into hell covered with the powder off heaven's floor which he had gathered in his passage through the airy boards upholding it. The poet was not much hurt. Heaven had let him down easy but we had to pay half a crown for the damage and I fear we very much knocked another nail in the coffin of the past. That stage will go the way of all stages the sooner for my young friend's careless impairing of it. Though he is a medieval poet and thin and hungry looking he is over six foot and an athlete. Another time some German friends took us to tea at a convent in the valley the convent of Kloster Arnsberg but very often it was to quite modern establishments that we went, erections like a smaller crystal palace, where those who prefer it can drink their tea or coffee in glass and under glass. I have lingered outside and watched the children playing ball and wondered to see their elders sitting mewed up, packed like herrings, eating indigestible cakes in very large sections. At Herrenhausen in the tea garden there, after we had ordered our coffee, we were invited by the waiter to do as everyone else was doing, and enter a glass house close at hand and choose our own confectionery. Their neat-handed dienstmädchen were deftly dispensing to moist-eyed votaries of pleasure sections of the most various and voluptuous cushion that imagination can conceive, or melting tongue render. The tables were covered with wooden trenches supporting discs of multicoloured pastry covered with sugar icing and set with crystallised fruit and flowers. Numb with awe, you pointed to the most bewildering example of all this riot of confectionery, and at once a large slab was cut off for you, deposited on a cardboard plate, and you carried it out. Thus did I, rejoining a slightly sceptical joseph leopold the sneer of the dieted was on his face and i sat down and ate my slab it was good but not so very good it was good as a cake could be i suppose it probably would give me a mild indigestion after the manner of rich cakes but it would not lay me under the table yes i was forced to admit that although i had chosen it for its tumultuous suggestion of excess its wild promise of poisonous joys. It was only a cake, and not so very rich at that. It was just like life or a novel of the East by a modern English novelist. It had momentarily given me the Eastern feeling and allowed me to imagine that for once I was practising the sin of enormity. Inside that glass-domed mosque where the choice had been made, I had dared to think that I was Sinbad in the Valley of Emeralds, or a pure Englishman in the bazaar of the naughty end of Cairo. The next moment I realised that the grey reality of greed, stripped and shorn of the prismatic colours lent it by the fecund imagination, was just a plain piece of zand cushion with sugar, nothing more. And I am afraid it is very much the same with novelists' accounts of the acme of dissipation, when the unhappy showman is driven to set down for his readers a picture of the terrible enormities that he has been hinting at and suggesting all through his earlier chapters. Joseph Leopold was drinking honest beer and knew nothing of these imaginations of mine, for German beer, properly made and kept beer, is the main point of this vast system of out-of-door junketing and do not let us forget it and the reason that the institution of the gartenwirtschaft does not flourish in england is mainly a question of beer end of section six Section 7 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 continued Beer Gardens and Bear Gardens. 
In one particular beer garden in the environs of Hildesheim, of which I am thinking, on a certain summer afternoon a troop of orderly, sober, decent, suave and gentle persons of all ages and sexes was sitting on freshly raked gravel at little tables covered all with red checkered tablecloths and with coffee cups and glasses on them their children sat beside them and their dogs couched at their feet or circulated about the feet of other clients birds hopped about under the tables picking up the crumbs which these gentle people from time to time cast to them there they sat stolidly composedly as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouths gulping down grosser hellers and kleiner dunklers and more and more of them with no diminution of their holy calm their dogs did not quarrel the birds still hopped about their toes in utter confidence everyone was sure that no chairs would be hurriedly pushed aside or angry words flout the sweet air they were taking in amid smoke of cigars or pipes and the soft breath of human converse and discreet wives with their children of all ages to think about kept an eye on the sun and saw that it was declining when they thought that it was time they folded up their fancy work wrapped up the remainder of the buns shook the crumbs off their children's bibs and folded them up likewise and turned their eyes westward to where the gilded spires of hildesheim seemed to point them to their homes then men got up and shook themselves and paid there was in them plenty of beer but not the least bit of harm in the world could the same have been said of men and women in a like case in england think even if other circumstances had been equal what it would have been after a couple of hours seance in england we should have had the ugly sights and sounds so demoralizing for children that an enlightened government in england has decreed that father and mother must run their own errands to the public house gross words would have broken the calm of the evening hour in the country of strenuous temperance and protective liquor laws but there are no places of this kind in england and if even a place of this description should have somehow or other scraped through with a license what manager would have dared to risk the responsibility of the direction of such a hotbed of trouble and drunkenness why even if he had got the government to lend him a force of police to hold in readiness he could not manage it it is to a certain extent the quality of english beer which prevents the establishment and survival of the innocent form of weekly saturnalia that i am advocating in england german beer is not in the least like in strength and quality or maturing to the stuff which notoriously wrecks the englishman's peace of mind his pocket and his home it is not heady it is diluted it is not drugged or doctored and it is kept properly i never saw in germany anything tantamount to the swinish buvette of france the terrible nouvelle bottle and jug entrance of england where brutal men and haggard women slouch in and out in search of their anodyne against the cold dull pallid misadventure of their homes for the public house in england is neither more nor less than a chemist's shop but the best drug of all is sold across the counter and where light is light more light and yet more light does any one realize the exhilarating powers of mere light on these animals coming blinking peering out of dark airless caves where they grovel on the fringe of destitution i am glad to think that the puritan spirit in england which vetoes colour charm gaiety and all attempts at beauty true or meretricious meretricious beauty is better than none at all cannot prevent the gas lamps flare however dreary the coarse irradiation that forcedly illumines every three or four paces of the dim street or alley when he is the temperance advocate bewailing every third house is a public house can they wonder 
the large coloured bottle in the windows of chemist shops are not there for nothing light attracts and both forms of drug stores have discovered that elementary fact in germany i am constantly pulling joseph leopold by the coat and praying him to let us enter here into this or that prettily decorated little hotel or restaurant with flowering oleanders in pots near the door and soft brise bees curtains in the windows and not too much brass about but plenty of nice brown panelling and as often as not he refuses because a gentleman cannot take a lady into what is after all a public house corresponding to the gin palace in england any place of call in england which permitted itself to be as attractive as any one of these would indubitably lose its license government morality would be on its hind legs at once lest vice should masquerade as health as joy as beauty it carefully penalises joy and merry-making by the enforcement of due ugliness in every place where this habit is permitted to be indulged does an english landlord desire to make his hotel or restaurant the least bit attractive he wisely sends out for his liquor sooner than ask for the license that is sure to be refused him on the pleasant face of it i have on several occasions persuaded joseph leopold to consent to take me on a sunday afternoon or evening where a concert of some sort is announced by a placard over the door of the anchor or the hirsch and to sitting on the edge of the form in front of a table with a white cloth and a mug of beer in front of me on a white pad to catch the drips i have watched the other quiet people husbands and wives brothers and sisters sweethearts lonely bachelors all likewise occupied and the strains of a good german band resound in my ears less cultivated than those of the modest couple beside me or the sweethearts who break off their lovers talk to listen and yet socially speaking i have really no business to be there and the solemn frauen who may be come next day to sit on the edges of the chair for a brief statutory visit would perhaps leave off calling if they knew where i had been sitting the day before for it is just as if i had been sitting with a hall porter and his wife with mary jones who opens the door to me with the men who clean the windows in a public house neither more nor less oh no i never mention it nor that i am writing a book about germany as an excuse for my indecent gregariousness but the use by my class of the open-air tea gardens some of them is not more reprehensible in germany than sitting in the park on a sunday on the slopes in kensington gardens in england it depends on the neighbourhood of course but in a garrison town say like trier you sit next officers in full uniform with long swords trailing in the dust beside them and smart german ladies with their dachshunds and poodles the carriages that have brought them out of trier stand with the shafts flung back on the green hard by waiting to take them back there is quite an atmosphere of the best people about it we had no carriage and no motor and we did not know our way about one afternoon at treves or trier what do i mean by spelling it in the french way we crossed the river aimlessly and reached the suburb called pallion and there the idea of tea i say tea from alien habit it is generally coffee overcame us and we wondered at the end of what nice longish walk a pleasant wirtschaftgarten might exist we followed a certain german family who had crossed in the ferry with us a family of about six persons an obvious papa and mamma a little boy a little girl a father-in-law a sister also a white pomeranian dog we stepped side by side with them to the foot of a sheer red mile cliff with a long ascent of stone steps cut out of it they were obviously preparing to climb it so as to attain to the heavy woods that clothed the summit it seems preposterous 
to earn one's tea in so painful a manner, but, as Joseph Leopold said, what they can climb, surely we can climb. And though my spirit fainted many a time, where a stout, heavily clad German Frau leads cheerfully, must not a slight, wiry, lanky ex-Englishwoman follow? And for nothing in the world would Joseph Leopold have desisted once the battle was joined. So we came after them at a respectful distance and began to ascend the stone steps. At the top we had a few moments to survey the famous Marienzoela. This is an altar to Minerva which the Roman occupiers of Trier placed there years ago. The pediment remains. For Minerva, the Virgin has been newly substituted. So placed, she dominates the town, and at night, the fan of seven electric lights that is arranged over her head in a sort of smoke cowl winks and stares like a beacon. We passed her, we passed the gates of two tea gardens. They appeared damp and closed for the season. It was October and a little late in the year for outdoor amusements. We passed them by. On the way, the little white dog showed an inclination to nag the big brown dog. The big dog showed the smaller one at once that it did not intend to allow it, and our wise guides endorsed the demonstration, though it was evidently attended with some discomfort to the little white dog, who was a fool and a pet. Having learned its limitations, it subsided, and there was no more fighting that journey. We all crossed a sunken meadow at the top, which seemed to me to be the crater of an extinct volcano, the sort of castle in which the whole village of Schwalbach is built, a valley sheltered in a hilltop. Then we proceeded to go uphill again, through covered ways where only two could walk abreast. These were skilfully engineered in the sides of the mountain, banked by spreading tree roots and roofed by their branches. We ceased to see the sky, or to know how much farther we should have to ascend. The thin stems of the trees stood away on either side of the hollow pathway. They were of a vivid coppery green that spoke eloquently of damp. We went along in comparative silence. We felt bound to leave a correct distance between us and the party in front, lest we should annoy them, and lead them to suppose that we were making use of them and did not know the way to to the place where we were all going quite as well as they did. But wherever it was, it was a very long way off, and we mounted always. Joseph Leopold was growing visibly and audibly thinner. Indeed, we both puffed and blew. We were not near enough to our guides to ascertain whether they were also out of breath but I fancy they were not. You see, they knew exactly how far their powers of endurance would be tested, and they were sure of tea and buns at the end. At least, we hoped so. But the dreadful supposition occurred to me. Were they all on their way to visit friends? Yes, probably going out to tea on some German Camden Hill or other, Joseph Leopold sneered. He considers my old home and its customs as painfully and ineluctably suburban, and never misses a chance of a jibe at it. But he did not want to upset me too much, and he was quite amiably sure that a tea garden of sorts was the vision that lay on the eyeballs of our precursors, a vision of an actuality and no false mirage. Still, the road wound uphill all the way which is quite contrary to the usual run of roads to dissipation of any kind. The spindle legs of the child in front began to wobble for me, and I ached and groaned audibly. We had come a good four miles, without seeing so much as one glimpse of encouraging daylight, and with us absolutely unable to gauge the probable height of the ascent we had so rashly taken. After all, this couldn't be the Eiffel for it wasn't marked large and looming on the map. 
and suddenly we lost them the white dog the spindle-legged child and the rest they seemed to sink with all our hopes of tea below the verge and that is exactly what had happened we had now reached the very top of the hill and the path had taken to going down as steeply as it had come up we hastened on and peered as it were over the edge and saw their heads and observed the man of the party stooping take the white dog off the lead we now gained hope they must by this sign feel that they were near a goal of some kind and that therefore the little cherished white dog could neither lose itself nor get into mischief and although hope now waxed strong our poor tired legs braced to the ascent we scented the reverse movements of descending we saw only a moral daylight no actual ray pierced the leafy canopy overhead but we were careful to lose the pioneers no more we kept them well in view until such time as after a fit of painfully increased velocity we seemed to tumble and fling ourselves down into a small green clearing fathoms below with the dull shimmer of a little river running peaceably and not in the least like the mountain torrent it should by rights have been and on its little banks there were orchard trees and a little house and beyond a green prairie dotted with little tables tables with tea heralding red cloths upon them a high hill covered closely with trees like the hill we had just descended rose up on the other side of the valley and shut the little paddock where the grass grew very green completely in and when we came nearer right down to the foot of our hill where the rustic bridge was that admitted into the little pocket garden i saw the glint of an officer's the glint of two officers uniforms i saw a handsome landau with its shafts turned back and i saw a man on a tree gathering plums on the river's brink my pains were assuaged we took a table ordered coffee and stufelkuchen all there was and waited until a handmaiden should appear bearing the usual packed tray treading delicately in the long grass for fear it should throw her down joseph leopold smoked a fat german cigar and i talked to all the friendly dogs that galloped round about and came to me and asked for pieces of cushion some of the officers who owned these dogs approved of my advances some of them didn't and called their beasts austerely to heel i was up against german convention again so i desisted and sat still and kept my eyes in the boat and watched the purple plums fall on the grass as the man in the tree shook them down hard by where i was sitting i watched a lady at the next table to me get up and take a fidgety fractious child a very fidgety fractious child for germany to stand under the tree and perhaps succeed in catching a plum in the lap of its frock and i heard the lady say in german smiling however as sweetly as possible on the rest of the party i leave my character behind me and i turned to joseph leopold and said how like camden hill would you like to leave at once and look for something less cosmopolitan but joseph leopold was happy and busied with guide books to enable him to find a different way back to trier neither of us wanted to climb all over the dead councillor again what a name for a hill so i went on listening trying to find out if the family of the lady who had taken the naughty child to see the plums fall were really taking her character or not schwetzen i don't believe they mentioned her she had apparently disarmed criticism they sat and watched the good children that remained consuming stufeltorte a very wholesome cake appropriated for young ravens because it is so dry that you are compelled to chew it adequately a way was found we left the dead councillor severely alone and walked home by the road to trier through the valley that broadens out as you approach the city we saw by the guide-book 
that ruins of the seats of roman country gentlemen flanked the road we were not very far from neumagen where constantine built himself a palace the road from altenhausen it was altenhausen where we had our coffee was very lonely in the gathering dusk the carriages in the inn-yard had long since been inspanned and had driven away the road was bordered with white stones at least they were white only on the sides where they faced the approach to the road at right angles the sides parallel to it were tarred black it is inconceivable that i should have had to ask joseph leopold the reason of this and i will not really insult the reader by passing on the explanation that was given me only i was under the impression that even with so much beer about the german coachman could always be trusted to know his way home in the dark it was quite dark when we at last reached the outskirts of the city of trier ugly and unsightly as even the outskirts of beautiful places are waste matter is always pathological and repulsive and the bigger and finer the house the greater amount of waste product will be engendered and one has somehow to take the detritus of civilization into account and make room for it it is like toleration in marriage there must be a midden and a box room but high up and far away on the heights we had travelled over that afternoon minerva virgin goddess under whatever name we know her by brooded and flung her seven rayed light wide over the dark alleys and railway sheds and trucks and the converging tram lines of the city she protects and dominates End of section 7section eight of the desirable alien at home in germany by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven princes and prescriptions the kur that great german institution in which englishmen and english women are glad to participate would appear to be specially designed for the traditional german the traditional German eats a great deal, drinks a great deal, and takes no exercise at all. Real Germans, a good many of them that I have known, eat very sparingly of food cooked à la mode du pays de France, and walk twenty miles a day. There are always, however, the obese and unregenerate of both nations, and these are pretty well represented at the dear smart little towns towns without personality or civic character of any kind which lie scattered all over germany that is the horrid part of it if you are well enough to do what is called poke about homburg or ems or nauheim or schwalbach you are all the while disagreeably conscious of the purely parasitical nature of the dull louts male and female who look sheepishly out of cottage doors or slouch about with pails and spill things into the gutter these good people you realize are tamely going about their business of living under the heel of the alien crowd of visitors by whom they exist i suppose v des and spas have a mayor and corporation but in the case of these sort of towns one feels they are only there for the convenience of visitors and to adjust any matters of business that may arise, say, a serious undertaking as the cure of illustrious and marked persons. I happened to be at Nauheim during the stay of the Tsar at Friedberg, a romantic visit undertaken for the cure of the Hessian princess who was the spouse of the shadowed despot of all the rushes. It was supposed by her physicians that the ruined nerves of the royal lady might benefit by a stay at one of the baths of her native country so the marked pair abandoned their policed palace and their royal safety yacht and came to hessen and motored in from the castle of friedberg three miles distant from nauheim every day 
detectives swarmed every yard of the way. Friedberg was full of them, and indeed, before His Majesty the Tsar could even be allowed to take up his abode in that place or visit Nauheim, the place of his wife's cure, the mayor and corporation of Friedberg had insisted on the royal guest insuring, out of his own pocket, all the principal buildings. Bombs will occur even in the best police-regulated establishments. And when the unfortunate royal guest, having complied with all these behests of a careful, tactless burgomastery, came over to Nauheim with his children, and essayed to walk quietly about in the streets of the town, he was himself, pecuniarily at least, protecting against the possible consequences of a too ready hospitality, he was mobbed and followed and persecuted. He complained bitterly, so he heard, and presently an urgent but polite notice did appear in the corridor of all hotels, asking the guests to be so good as not to mob the Tsar. I fear very few of them attended to the prohibition. La chasse au Tsar continued, and attract the poor man into a shop, and making what is called a feint of an ugly rush, lead him to believe that he was in a guet à pense, was recognised as a lawful amusement by certain dull, enervated people who form the staple of the patrons at Nauheim. Anyone who, as I did, expected to see an enormous proportion of traditional Germans in these sort of places will be disappointed. It was rather the other way at any rate at Nauheim or Schwalbach, for one fat German I saw two lanky Englishmen with wives to match. English dyspepsia seems to attenuate, not increase the girth. I saw the ethereal heroines of English cause célèbre walking about reading good books. I saw croupy young Englishmen doddering along the pleached alleys with glasses in their hands, the murky contents of which were connected with their mouths by a tube, and little napkins to wipe out said glasses tucked into their sleeves. English self-indulgence would appear to take the form of malnutrition, and weak hearts to be the result not of intemperance in diet, but some mad riot of nerves. However, there they all were, parading, promenading, taking short red walks or long blue walks, according to their physical capacities for relating, and that of the friend who accompanied them for listening to, detailed and never-ending recitals of their symptoms. A cour is the only place where it is literally manners to talk of your stomach. With brief intervals for the reconnoitring of the paint marks on the green trunk, so considerately put there by the Kaiser's order, each part of a system for pointing the way for the walk of a given duration, the conversation in a court promenade is all pathological, deeply egotistical, and boring to the hero who is not in a position to offer up one of his own defaulting nerves for dissection on the platter of friendship. There is indeed only one way of enjoying oneself at a court. Every prospect pleases and so on, but one must be allowed to forget the reason why man is admitted into this paradise. Once and once only I paid the toll to Caesar, took a bath and took a drink. The drink upsets you for days. The bath is neither here nor there. It was at Schwalbach I was immersed. I felt as if I were champagne, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim. This agreeable sensation lasted ten minutes. Then, plötzlich, an impartial machine of a stout bathing woman came noiselessly into the badzimmer, unceremoniously brushed the mousse off me with a large bathing towel, and I became myself again, with only such bubbles of the spirit as nature has endowed me with. The people at Akur unmistakably enjoy talking about their symptoms, one notices that perhaps the most fanciful and discursively descriptive among them, while anxious to retain the sympathy of their fellow sufferers, 
are chiefly intent on evading the more tiresome minutiae of the cure on having a good time in short and the cunning german physicians are no doubt fully aware of that and depend on the good air of the place and the fascinations of the landrat he is always a good-looking fine set-up man it appears to me far more than on prescriptive rules which are meant for really ill people these form the dark grey background of the crowd of merrymakers these are the people who do actually die and whose remains are hustled away in the night or early morning to avoid unpleasantness and a german hearse is of the most sinister grim charges with black trappings that come down to the ground suggesting the armoured destria of the days of feudal fighting through which the vast round eye of the horse gleams forth large portentous in its rim of sable strike a foolish terror to the beholder and remind him disagreeably of the fact that doctor's orders are not always made to be disregarded but seriously speaking a real cure undertaken in a business-like manner with a pure liver and a contrite stomach simply means putting one's neck into a collar of slavery if you do not consistently regard your doctor as a meddling rival neither your time nor your money is your own whereas if you keep up a proper degree of spirit in your dealings with him you have the cheerful sensation so conducive to health of moral self-assertion a moral victory something done something accomplished and the really excellent air of nauheim or schwalbach or wherever you have elected to reside to the good the iron in which these regions abound enters then into your body not your soul and you benefit by the cure you flirt with the handsome landrat who as i have remarked is always good-looking enough to be worth while in these carefully catered for health places you win enormous sums at bridge enough to pay all your home debts which are secretly worrying you and you do really and truly benefit by the cure in your own way which is the best on the other hand if you virtuously lay yourself out to observe faithfully all the narrow-minded pettifogging unimaginative behests of your temporary lawgiver who doesn't know you or your mentality from adam and who is in league with your landlord for early closing and plain living and high paying your cure at once becomes a mere purgatory of small agitating engagements far more innovating and exacerbating even than the london or paris or berlin season you have come away to recover from here is dr biddleman's sort of regulation i may mention that dr biddleman of nauheim is charming and a thorough man of the world and doesn't in the least hope or expect you to carry it out you bath at ten say then lie down after it for an hour good you do bathe the expense of bath is something positive that you pay for but good heavens you don't have time to lie down you can lie down for nothing and at home you eat by command at some earthly hour one o'clock most probably and you are to eat the very things you don't like you are to have your salad mixed with lemon juice instead of oil and vinegar and you are to drink fachingen but how can you talk or be amusing on fachingen how can you digest what you don't like well you settle it you do eat later it was so difficult to get away from that fascinating seance at what do you call him zucker becker mulle and the little cakes spoilt your appetite you eat the things you like at lunch that is to say the things you can eat and you don't lie down again after as desired because lying down always makes your head ache so and for all these extra arrangements there simply isn't time that is the trouble not want of bon volonté on your part if you followed out all the absurd directions you are given and that your physician feels in duty bound to order you you might as well have stayed away altogether 
for you would be useless for all the social purposes that really brought you to Nauheim or Schwalbach or Schlangenbad. And there is the truth of it. For, good heavens, there is here, said Nauheim, a bathing establishment, a spring and what not, just to give the place its name, but there is a great deal more. The bathing establishment and the spring are only the bait, the inducement, something that corresponds to the little music you arrange for a party at home to make people talk. The band at the garden party, the lady who sings Indian lullabies, the child who recites so marvellously and whose name you're sure you forget. It is the brilliant magic poor house that you have come for, where all is silent and nearly deserted in the mornings, and waiters and other ministers of our joys hold themselves in reserve till midday, when all breaks into life and song. You may see performances, you may go to concerts, you may play bridge all the afternoon under the open sky or the tented veranda. The soft sunlight permeates all your gaiety, softening the glare of the red geraniums in the parterre and the blue caps of the bandsmen, and the screaming toilettes of the professional beauties. You can play lying in a bath chair if you prefer it, with a rug over your knees to get the spirit of the place. The soft, pleasing, egoistic spirit of wealthy invalidism. And the afternoon wears on to the sound of the chastened band, the delicate crunch on gravel of high-heeled shoes, and the trail of ethereal Paris-made garments. You eat succulent cakes and drink mixtures through straws brought to one by well-drilled waiters, who never tread on your toes or tear your flounces. You win, you lose. The sunlight soaks into you and you go home to change. What for? To don the most expensive form of dress known, the half-high, the smart non-décolleté. Modistes know how incompatible the two are. Inferior craftswomen rely on the wearers to mean the dress with their own charms, as it were. Thus expensively, ruinously robed, you eat good dinners under the fierce electric light. And as the one concession to the spirit of the place, and it is the only concession some patients make, and then it is only because they are constrained by the management, home to bed early. At the hotel, arriving quite early, a reproachful house porter lets you into a twilight hall. It feels like three in the morning in England. If you happen to be a little late, say after ten, there is even a vague atmosphere of reprobation about this functionary, erst gold-laced, but in mufti after ten. I felt again as a girl feels when she comes home in the small hours to be let in by a sleepy, reproachful maid, whose duty it has been to sit up and welcome this piece of perishable goods that has been out in the great wild world. The Kur House of Nauheim is on the slope of the hill, a little above the town. It is pretty and gay, like most Kur houses everywhere. Its clients are, of course, thoroughly cosmopolitan, comprising complacent financiers, hungry adventurers, beauties on the make of every type and nationality, at least so I am led to suppose and i fancy that is the attraction of these foreign baths to the english nation thackeray skilfully cast around these clients of german thermal springs that vague aroma of devagondage that intimate flavour of impropriety of possible scabrous adventure which appealed so deeply and intimately to the middle class for which he catered Needless to say, Baden-Baden, or Nauheim, met tout c'est bien dans la déventure. The shady people are the décor. The attraction provided for Mrs. Brown of Brixton, who was there with Mrs. Jones of Ealing, in force enough to make these places pay. Mrs. Brown of Brixton thinks it is a holiday privilege to be allowed at Rome, to do as Rome does, to put down her gold piece at the same table as Madame Médée, or Countess Calypso, I borrow Thackeray's effective nomenclature. She expects, as I did, the first time I went to Baden-Baden and Homburg, 
to see sinister-looking pernicious gentlemen engrossed in playing petit chevaux or baccarat Thackeray had named them for me count punter marquis iago captain blackball and it was only after i had been about that i realized that the most sinister looking of them all were respectable english stockbrokers husbands of the mrs browns who boldly touched hems with the skirts of it was fondly hoped unmentionable ladies only in the holidays the sight of weeping dover cliffs on the return home purges away all the foreign devilry that mrs brown may have picked up on her travels i know mrs brown now once i might have taken her for madame de couche or madame de schlangenbad opening and scandal-mongering on her cane chair and the wicked lady q that comes hobbling on her crutches round the corner is much more likely to be somebody's maiden aunt come away from her provincial lair for a thorough change and mogador la princesse de mogador tu fume mogador here thackeray was really funny sat in every railway train well she sits there now mogadors we have always with us she trails past my modest chair even now with her cortege of grand dukes and quote favourite officers of the emperor in which the place abounds but just as all the champagne grown could not back up the marks on the bottles that stand on the restaurant tables so would the kaiser's favour though this label is given impartially to every smart officer these fine fellows have all hearts the ugly material lopsided one within them they have generally injured by excessive attention to and prowess at polo that is the chic cause of their presence at nauheim the kaiser does not care to lose them the other more elusive article they swear by and are fond of putting their hand to is at the service of every pretty girl who comes to nauheim without a heart at all poor wasp-wasted creatures as fast as they cure the one organ the other spiritual one suffers by reason of its extreme susceptibility i was able to oblige one young officer with an unpronounceable name i may meet him again the kaiser loves him of course and he has some english he admired a young english lady who was staying not in my hotel but in the hotel of a friend of mine who just knew her by sight Affected by Lieutenant L's persuasions, I got my friend to scrape acquaintance with Miss D, and eventually asked her to tea in her room. I brought Lieutenant L, so full of pleasurable anticipation and excitement that he could eat no cakes at tea. But the affair came to nothing. I discovered that the dream to the spiritual young favourite of the Kaiser was more than the business. Yet now formerly made the acquaintance of his goddess and consequently he no longer found pleasure in decorously dogging her footsteps in the cool garden and under the tall trees of the allee as she fared home she had a pale clear-cut face and a neat ankle and wore high-heeled shoes with a big bow in the instep that looked as if it never could come untied grand dukes real grand dukes are fairly plentiful at cures you can be taken in though and some americans i once met at langenschwalbach felt this little form of humiliation very much there was a stout beefy gentleman with a toady in attendance who wrote on his card duc de sirio and stuck it on the green bay's notice board in the hotel among the cards of the other visitors i've never seen this remarkable custom anywhere else but that gentleman's card-case must have been soon exhausted for some real gentlemen bearing good old english names staying at the hotel tore it down every day declaring this was no duke but a grocer from amsterdam and his handyman who sliced up the hams we all danced with the duke at the cursal he danced beautifully the american contingent had gone nap on him and refused to believe that he was an impostor but the absurdly meek manner in which he or his toady for him 
conscientiously replaced his card every day instead of calling out one of the hooligan gentlemen who were endeavouring to destroy his prestige with the ladies ended by convincing these fair ones that the claim so weakly supported could not be genuine they abandoned him with painful self-loathing i for some mysterious reason fancied he was what he said there was a depth of assurance about him a steady stout devil-may-carishness that was soothing to be truly soothing is a quality of the true aristocracy in germany at all events there was however an unmistakable publicly ratified grand duke at nauheim while i was there i believe he was related to the kaiser so popular was he that he only dined once at his own expense during the whole six weeks that his cure lasted and that once was when he as in duty bound returned all this hospitality in the lump for every pretty woman in the place felt it her pleasant duty to dine with him at least once and invite any lady he admired as well as herself he preferred americans and an occasional incursion into dutch territory probably because americans are still capable of being frankly dazzled by the old order which is by no means passing away in germany he was a dear good rubicund soul with no harm in him and exquisite manners and looking at him through the glass window that divided the indoors restaurant from the little tables outside where one drinks one's coffee one found some difficulty in realizing that he was a king he sat there towards the end of a good dinner très en edouard as someone said and indeed the likeness to our own edward the seventh was striking with jungfrau van der hulker on one side and mrs douglas p friday on the other both Solomon décolleté, both yielding, caressing, jolly and easy-going, as far as their own strong sense of propriety and the rules of the place permitted. One felt that, veiled by the social hypocrisies of the twentieth century, the usual royal programme of the seventeenth and eighteenth was being rehearsed. They had all dined too well. The ladies were all impressed to slavishness by the gracious favour of the potentate, and perfectly prepared for any due old-fashioned exercise of the royal prerogative yet they sat there and digested and sipped liquors and said nothing they were all flushed but with the effort of eating they were all bored and that was with the grand duke but they were dining with a king even if they did not realize it as i did these stout, healthy scions of old reigning families are spread all over Germany, rulers of federated states allied to Prussia, not loving Prussia, defying Prussia, some of them. But the submissive ones do really carefully and seriously rule over the small states that are theirs by inheritance. They have their own courts of justice, their own little armies, degenerated in most cases into a mere bodyguard, and in some others into a household of servants who could fight if need be one reads in english social annals of german serenities german princes german hochvollgeborenen all alluded to in a slightly contemptuous style introduced by a man who had both what is called a down on germany and a sneaking fondness for her thackeray nothing but his love for the protestant succession kept his tongue from covering the four georges with an overwhelming load of journalese mud and dapper george got off lightly with the clinging sobriquet but on grand dukes and serenities his pen has always wagged rather indecorously and english people seem to have adopted his characterization and regard these politically earnest and serious people as mere social symbolical furniture to live in a bazaar or gild a society column and indeed their unobtrusive presence at the vie d'eau lends a colour to their desultory view of the importance of their functions they should be seen at home in the due exercise of them it is when you are in some obscure provincial town 
and pay your way in coin struck in their effigy and hear them in their princely doings the literary moral artistic opinions of their wives spoken of with respect that one realises for the nonce and with regard to the particular piece of ground that you stand on the despised grand duke is your king and that there is no parliament to stand between you and him any impulsive decree he may choose to put forth at the dictates of his so respectable or capricious wife perhaps and motivated by some entirely personal feeling is law the wife of the grand duke of h has chosen to close down the state theatre in h because of the private life reported to her of some of the members of the famous company engaged to play in it you see the king's powers though not extensive are absolute he is your commissioner of woods and forests your board of trade your chancellor of the exchequer your head of police all in one your overlord in fact his place one of his places fills up the centre of the town he may live in it and lend it as a park when he is not there or when he is there and amiably disposed he may live somewhere else and loan it as a barrack he has plenty of houses outside the town lie his schlosses and pleasure seats where so many beds are always made up ready for himself and sweet or any guests he may send and where he takes your mark for a sight of his old armour and family pictures and beds his powers are apt to your limited topographical intelligence to cease quite abruptly a thin line as imperceptible as the solemn old mysterious equatorial division of our childhood separates the particular sods of earth under his direction from those that own the sway of the next prince yes a man in hessen darmstadt may lead a horse to water and twenty can make him drink in hessen nassau the rules of life and conduct are perfectly different full of character full of annoyance too sometimes mental friction is thereby daily produced in hessen nassau say you knock up against some teasing trifling ordinance or by-law you exclaim indignantly but have always done that and when you were in a fair way to be arrested you recover yourself and realize that that was when you were a quarter of an hour ago in hessen darmstadt and in the eyes of the instructed in such matters local costume may even mark the change and not too insidiously either sitting in the train looking out idly on the weather-beaten human furniture of the fields you can tell to a nicety in whose kingdom you are the noble female creatures with their stately port who cover the ground in hessen marking the furrows with their broad swinging strides wear vast woollen petticoats kept out as we women would say by bolsters at the hips of a strong stained glass window colour suggesting the pictures of ford maddox brown red green and blue all of them at once it is harmonious enough in the clear strong light that seems to shine nearly always in germany on their heads they wear little knobby caps in shape like an ensign's embroidered with seed pearls and broad black ribbon strings falling on either side of the face like one of andrea del sarto's madonnas you are in hessen darmstadt farther on as you look out the petticoats are made of coarse stiff black calico shining coppery and iridescent in the sun the beggar maid's clothes in king cafetua have just such a metallic sheen on their legs they wear thick white open-work stockings with coloured ribbon garters ostentatiously displayed and on their feet heavy shoes with buckles you may know that you are in hesse when you see as the train leaves the station a couple of these women looking like beetles burnished in the sun with their hay-forks lightly poised on their shoulders walking in skirts that jeannet would think far too short to dance in down the asphalt road talking and gesticulating like fury under the hot exhausting glare they are fairly cool their skirts are of calico not woollen and they have no bolsters 
and after the train has stopped three weary times more, long, draggled, abject-looking skirts, such as one sees anywhere in England, are the fashion. Another district. And these represent the really free peoples of Germany. At least, though they are the property of a grand duke, who owes in his turn allegiance to Prussia, they have not taken Prussia's prizes for costume. Prussia cunningly encourages the survival of costume because it enhances in its wearers the feeling of their German nationality. For many centuries, indeed, these Hessian lands felt a great spiritual kinship for France. And even today, in many of the lonely farms of the older peasants, you will find portraits of the great Napoleon. Sometimes, indeed, this opposition to the immense and savage dominion of one state over all others assumes heroic proportions. It is a curious sensation to walk about in Hanover, stately and magnificent Hanover, and be told that a regent holds sway there, and that the real potentate lives in exile in Munich. Footnote. Written in 1910. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. He is in contravention of the Kaiserliche decree. He refuses to swear allegiance to the Emperor, and until he does so he may not walk under his ancestral limes or sleep in one of the hundred beds that are constantly kept made in his country seat of Wilhelmsberg. He is old, he does not care. He is one of the truly romantic figures of the twentieth century. But who should meet him in London society? would probably regard him as a mere figurehead for bazaars and opening festivals. I should like to meet him, for I know better. End of section 8